I came back home to raise crops and, God willing, a family. So you want me to marry you then? I love you. Scotland. My land. Sons of Scotland! I am William Wallace. He's quite a heroic character. He's completely uncompromising which is why he's such an extraordinary character and why there's a 300-foot monument still standing in Scotland. This one will fight forever. It's a wonderful story, and I hope that people understand how important it was to this man to fight for what he believed in. You tell your king that William Wallace will not be ruled. Peace is made in such ways. Slaves are made in such ways. It's an epic film. It really is life and death and... and darkness and the light. Action! And the picture of his scope to actually be in front of the camera and behind the camera. It's ambitious. I must admit I burned a few brain cells on it. This is going to be a picnic. The driving force behind this is his passion for the project and uh, it comes right from the feet up. And I think this film has compassion and I think that comes from Mel's heart. Really. They may take our lives! But they'll never take our freedom! Stand by. Let's get our original positions, please. Here we go. The room. Sound speed. E camera, Marco. Action. I want this Wallace's heart on a plate. Shift nervously from foot to foot, guys, in the background. Is he going to send you? Look up to your commanding officer. Is he going to send you? Eyeball him. What's going on? What are you waiting for? Leave them! I never was conscious of a point when I wanted to be an actor or a director or anything else. It just kind of happened. I'm a real film nut. In the 60s, when I was growing up, I was mainly acquainted with film through television. And I like the big ones, you know? I like the big country, you know, that film, that western? I like Double Indemnity with Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck. Romantic films, you know. We did it so we could be together, but instead of that, it's pulling us apart, isn't it, Walter? What are you talking about? And you don't really care whether we see each other or not. Shut up, baby. But at the same time, I like Spartacus, you know, the huge epic films. These films were great films, great films. You can still watch them and still get the same buzz off them. And it was the epic films that really inspired me to do Braveheart. Stand by. This is a little piece of cinema history. Rarely do you see this many people in the shot. The script was given to me on an acting basis, of course, but uh, I felt like I had to tell the story all of a sudden because I kept reworking scenes in my head. You know? So that's a fairly good indication that you should probably direct it if, if, um, if you're building the images and sequences in your head. I am William Wallace. You've come to fight as free men. And free men you are. The script was a, a very haunting piece of work. It wasn't predictable. And uh, just the sheer size of it. And uh, it's just a funny corner of history that um, I'd never heard of before. It's based on a character called William Wallace, who did exist in the 13th century in Scotland. He was a commoner. He was also a patriot. And he was actually successful in defeating the English. Wallace was truly interested in liberty and loved his country, and he really just wanted to be free and wanted freedom for his fellows. But at the same time, he was kind of a savage. Because at the Battle of Stirling, he skinned the commanding officer on the other side and turned him into a belt. Probably a matching handbag and shoes, too, but, like, uh... So, like, this is the, the dichotomy of the man. If we join, we can win. If we win, well, then we'll have what none of us have ever had before. A country of our own.
My wife and I were in Edinburgh, and we walked into the castle there and saw the statue of William Wallace. I thought, this is a Wallace, a famous Wallace, and, and I'd never heard of him. And I asked one of the guards there who he was, and he said, well, he's our greatest hero. And I began to read about him. But the actual facts of William Wallace's life, as established by historians, are, are minuscule. It's kind of sketchy, and you have to fill in. But uh, luckily, there's also a lot of legend that surrounds the character. William Wallace is seven feet tall. Wallace killed 50 men. A hundred men. And if he were here, he'd consume the English with fireballs from his eyes and bolts of lightning from his arse. <laughs> I am William Wallace. Those legends gave me a window into who the man truly was, how he had felt about his country, who he had loved, how he had loved. I'm playing Murren, who is the woman who William Wallace falls in love with. And it starts in the marketplace where they notice each other again, and I think it's a love at first sight thing. And there's a link there from an early age. They knew each other when they were kids, and they had this kind of a spiritual bond early on. And when he came back, he came back for her, and, and uh, it was all meant to be. I love you. Always have. She represented his desire to live in peace. He didn't want to go and, and fight and kill and suffer. He would have liked to have lived in peace, to have raised a family. And she was the thing that propelled him. He carried her with him always, whatever he did, wherever he went. I will love you my whole life. You and no other. Catherine McCormick hadn't done much before. I think she'd done a small film. And I just kind of got a vibe off her. I just liked her. Uh, she's a very likable person. She's beautiful. The character needed to be beautiful. She's a good actress. And she seemed just right for that part. Action. First day was very tense. I was, oh my God, big budget, huge budget. What do I do? But uh, I'm working with Mel, who's, I thought, oh no, big superstar. But he's just the nicest guy, really down to earth. Guy. <laughs> I find when I'm actually doing a scene with him, I don't get so much direction. We sort of feel things through a lot more. And he's great for ad-libbing and, and just letting you run with the script. It's a very human story about real people. Well, there's real characters on the page, and it was my job to strive to make those characters even more real. So I was casting this thing for months, and I didn't read anyone. You know, people read people, and I just, I don't think that that's any use. Uh, so what I used to do was just sit down and talk to them for 15 minutes, and, and you can tell. The trouble with Scotland is that it's full of Scots. <laughs> Patrick McGowan is a very intelligent actor who I admired as a kid. And I used to watch Danger Man and, and The Prisoner and all these things on television, which he conceived these things. So that I was really flattered when he agreed to do this. The archers are ready, sire. Not the archers. Arrows cost money. Use up the Irish. The dead cost nothing. Patrick plays Longshanks, which is the nickname for King Edward I. He was one of England's most ruthless leaders. And he was not very fond of William Wallace. Bring me Wallace. Alive, if possible. Dead. Just as good. Longshanks spent most of his reign procuring Scotland and getting that within his realm so that he had control of that. And he did subdue Scotland, so he should make you feel like a subject, you know, which uh, Patrick has the capacity to do that. His performance as Longshanks is very sinister. Wallace has already killed the magistrate and taken control of the town. Action! And a film of this size, coupled with the responsibilities of acting and the pressure of directing, um, it's a very demanding task. It obviously puts a lot more pressure on Mel. Oh, it's an absolute passion for him. He has his own point of view, and a very strong point of view. What's wrong with having a couple of poles sliding this way, just through the shot, you know? It's totally absorbing, so that you live, eat, breathe, sleep 
this story and the telling of it. The cavalry's behind you. Start running everywhere. Entourage, take off. It's like being dropped in the middle of an ocean. And you just look around and there's nothing but water around, but you figure, well, there's got to be land. I think I'll go that way. And it's just one stroke at a time. I had to get up earlier than everyone, really, because I had to get dolled up and ready for the, <laughs> the task ahead. OK, we're going to shoot. Bye, please. What I was doing was just hopping in front of the camera, doing it as best I could, hopping off, looking at it. If it wasn't a total disgrace, I might do another one for safety and get the hell off. Oh, man, that's a good, a good camera. But because I was so focused on the, the storytelling and, and all other aspects of the whole thing, it brought a lot of relaxation to it because I simply didn't have the energy left to be tense with. Scotland was very rainy. I mean, it rained almost constantly. Not the real teeming kind of rain, but the kind of rain that always drizzles and never stops. They had chosen to do the filming up near Inverness. And when the filming began, they discovered that it was one of the rainiest places, in fact, the rainiest spot in all of Europe. <laughs> it's all a question of conditioning. We just decided to shoot. I just said, you can't worry about the weather. You just got to go for it. Otherwise, you'd never get it done if you stopped every time it rained. And so we just shot it. I got to get used to it anyway. Let's do it. <laughs> well, it was miserable. We had to do take after take after take after take. Well, obviously the horse doesn't want to stay here, but... Hold it! I was getting phone calls, and they were telling me, oh, the conditions are just miserable. It looks absolutely gorgeous, but every step is an effort. Our noble saviors have arrived! Yeah, I think it helped creatively on the film. The mud got all over everyone's clothes and on their faces and it uh, created a look that we would not have had if the weather didn't, didn't uh, design it for us. It's primitive, man. There's dirt under their fingernails. But it, as it would have been, you know. In the 13th century, I'm sure that the mortality rate was high. And anybody that managed to survive was of really hardy, strong stock. If the plague didn't get them or if they weren't eaten by leprosy or some horrible thing. If you lived past the age of 30, they, you know, you were a superman. Buy him off. Who knows him? I am the Princess of Wales. She meets him because uh, the king organized uh, a meeting to make a compromise for peace. They come from two different worlds. She's a princess. He's a he's a poor Scottish man. But somewhere she realized that they are very similar and she feels with him not lonely anymore. Longshanks selected the bride for his son, Edward II. He picked this beautiful woman who was brought to London to meet a man that she didn't know, who didn't know her. And there was truly nothing between the two of them. It's her big day because she's getting married and we realize during the scene that her husband doesn't love her and he probably loves someone else and this someone else is just behind my back and he's a young man so uh, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman the, the fact is that she's not loved. I found that relationship fascinating and Mel captured it in absolute beauty with looks. You never know, you were doing great. But I think it's the last one you look up here. In their wedding, there's no dialogue at all. It's shot with just looks. But he absolutely captured the separation of these two people and the tragedy of two people brought together and expected to love each other when there was nothing between them. Mark up. Action. Sophie has been in, in films since she was like a, a kid. She's very experienced and a big star in France. 
So she knows her way around a film set, and she knows what to do in front of the camera. Now, Sophie, peek out. She's regal. She's literally like a statue, a living statue. I mean, she's very statuesque. And I think comes off great in the film. And cut. Mel's a good director of actors because himself, he's a really, really good, excellent actor. That's my supposed sphere of expertise, you know, so I try and make it as comfortable for them as I can. And if they're comfortable, then they'll be more relaxed. And if they're more relaxed, I think you'll get better things from them. The best way to access any of this stuff is to, like, have fun with it. And the rest will follow. I mean, you just can't take it seriously. <laughs> He's a grand lad, good sense of humor, a bit of devilment in him, certainly. <laughs> He's just good fun. <laughs> I mean, you're there, and there's thousands of people all around, and you're the guy who's responsible for all this budget, all these people. It's all on your shoulders. So you might as well not get worried about it, because the minute you start doing that, you're going to get yourself into a knot. Now, you have achieved more than anyone ever dreamed of fighting these odds that looks like rage. And I'm Robert the Bruce in this film. He's sort of the head of the nobles whom William Wallace comes to visit to basically try to get them on their side to unite the country to beat the English. And there's no telling who'll be next. And it's an interesting character because he's kind of a bit of a lost soul. Maybe you. He wavers. Maybe me. <laughs> He's constantly drawn to the darker aspects of compromise and wealth and preserving the castles and the lands which, which he has, along with all of the other wealthy people in that country. Two, one, seven, three, let's take one. Unite us. Unite us. Right. He did fight for the English. The nobility was famous for just switching sides. I mean, for whatever worked for them, they'd do it. Uh, see, there was no sense of, of that unity that Wallace had. They changed their loyalties like people change their underpants, you know? Those men who bled the ground red at Falkirk, they fought for William Wallace and he fights for something that I've never had. And I took it from him when I betrayed him and I saw it in his face on the battlefield. The dynamic between William Wallace and Robert the Bruce is one of the most exciting aspects of the whole story. In fact, it may be, in some ways, the true heart of the picture. Because William Wallace would rather shed every drop of his blood than yield an inch. But Robert the Bruce was more like I think most of us are. He was a man who wanted to do the right thing, but also tried to face the realities of life and make the compromises that were necessary. If you make enemies on both sides of the border, you'll end up dead. Oh. We all end up dead. It's just a question of how uh, and why. One of the things that I knew that I wanted to do with this picture was to make it so that it moved all the time. I watched all the battle films I could lay my hands on to see the kind of territory that's been covered before and then tried to go further with it and really get the feeling of what it must be like to be in the middle of a 13th century battle. Get the smell of it. Your friends are being hacked to pieces. They're getting war picks slammed into their helmets and their brains are falling out. My God. You have to execute it like a battle. And so a large number of people sat around a table and we actually planned these battles out and did storyboards and the whole nine yards because we knew that once we got in there, we were going to have to rely a lot on, on pre-planning. So be absolutely still and just look at straight ahead at what's, what you've got to do and what might be coming at you. We recognized early that the secret to this was going to be getting some sort of disciplined uh, assistance. We needed 1,600 disciplined extras, and the only place you're going to find them are in the army. We're using the FCA here in Ireland, uh, which is their volunteer force, so we're blessed by using disciplined troops. Uh, we drew up a, a document known now as the Battle Plan, which is an interlocking tent system to accommodate 1,400 men where they come in in the morning in fatigues and then, having gone through the system, come out in the other end as Scots. We were fortunate to have the Reserve Army, and they were divided into companies of 50. 
But it was an incredible system. They'd start in the wardrobe tent and put on their battle gear. Then they moved down to makeup. Get your sunscreen on, then get your dirt on. Let's go. And we put war paint on them, and then they'd smear themselves with dirt and mud to make them look like real savages. Drum it well in. Backs of your legs, backs of your necks. Do your ears. Check the guy out next door. And then finally we'd march them down into the armory where we had thousands of battle toys for them to pick from. Come on, guys, it's not a shop. Just pick one up and go. There were some days there when there were over 2,000 people involved and with but one purpose, with but, you know, one vision, which is, uh, it's kind of cool uh, to have all those people working for that one shot. There's a thousand bare asses. That's got to be in the Guinness Book of Records, the most bare asses on screen in one shot. You know, I don't think I've ever seen that before. And that is accurate. The Scots, they used to um, lift their kilts and flash the other side. They used to freak the other side out. No point resisting. You're outnumbered and trapped. That was Wallace. The military brilliance and innovative spirit of William Wallace is one thing that certainly comes through in the film. He was inventive. He was a genius of military strategy. He was an instinctive battlefield commander. And it's fascinating to look at a man who was able to pick up a sword and stand his ground on the battlefield. Our cavalry will ride them down like grass. Oh! Wallace was the first person to really stand up against these horse charges with the use of the Shiltrum, which is like a, a lot of sharpened wooden stakes. They could group into a small thing and have a porcupine skin so nobody could gain access. Because they didn't have bullets, you know. They had to get in there and stick you with something. We have some more sticks in here, some more Shiltrums. Yep, yep. It's yep. just looking a little light. Well, the violence of battle has got to be recreated. And to do that without hurting anybody, that's, that's the trick, and that's what we're about right now. We're trying to recreate our stunt, which we're not allowed to do anymore. But what it does, it somersaults the horse and throws the person off. There are certain things uh, that, you, that you shouldn't and can't do with animals anymore. So I got together with Mick Rogers and said, let's make mechanical horses. So the we don't want to hurt any real horses. Uh, we make ones that look real and do hideous things to them. They're basically foam, you know, but they have a metal structure inside, so they weigh about 250 pounds apiece. But we'll have to go through, like, a test period where we have to make sure the horse is working right, because this is not something you just can't just don't want to do it over and over again. You want to do it one time and walk away. The track is now live, so keep off the track. Stay off the tracks. This shot here, it's expensive. You know, these these horses cost hundred thousand dollars. The track costs about forty thousand dollars, and the time involved, you know, thirty stunt guys. I mean, we're trying to put nine horses, three of them mechanical, crashed at one time. Here we go, and roll. It's great. I don't think anyone's ever done that before. Action. You can spot them, you can have 10 bucks, you know. That's only you I'm talking to. <laughs> oh.